Good afternoon and welcome to Chapter 17, Pediatric Emergencies for the Emergency Medical Responder. Let's get started. We're going to talk about kids. Do we have emergencies with kids? Absolutely. Oh, speaking of, some moms wouldn't find this as an emergency, but we in the uh, profession of emergency medical response uh, can definitely condone this as an emergency because of the airway problem. So this is an issue. So we need to think about these things. You know, when we see a child that is sick, we need to manage it as an emergency. All right, so just as an introduction with pediatrics, we're talking about sudden illness and medical emergencies are very, very common in children and infants. And there's some anatomical differences that you guys need to know about it. You know, there's special knowledge and skills that are needed to assess uh, and treat children and infants. Uh, respiratory care for children is extremely important. And emergency medical responders should have some basic information and treatments that are common for pediatric emergencies. All right, so managing the pediatric emergency can be one of the most stressful situations you face as an EMR. Uh, in an atmosphere where everyone is involved, it's very, very tense. Uh, so you must remain calm and uh, behave in a very controlled and professional manner. Emergency medical services or EMS personnel often have mixed feelings when treating a child. It can be one of the most panic moments of your life where you can get control of it. So unless you're prepared, your anxiety and fear may interfere with your ability to deliver proper care. All right, so the parents. The child's parents or caregivers can either be allies or potentially a problem. You need to talk to both the parents and the child as much as possible. Communication is the key. Keep people in the loop. Helpful parents can tell you how the child's behavior is different from his or her own usual behavior. And then, of course, children uh, get many of the behavioral cues from their parents. So calm the parents and ask for their assistance in calming their child. If possible, let a parent hold the child. Try to develop a rapport with the child and with the parents. Tell the child your first name, find out uh, what the child's name is, and then use the child's name as you explain what you're doing. Squat, kneel, or sit down to establish eye contact directly with the child. And ask simple questions about the pain or about the problem that you're there for. All right, so be honest with the child. Tell the child what you're going to do and explain that it may hurt. In talking to the child, you can also request his or her help. Some agencies provide the child with a trauma or a teddy bear of some sorts. As you can see here in this particular photograph, there is a uh, teddy bear that looks like it's made from a simple cloth and it may have been obtained from some organization. So anyhow, these are good tools. As you can see here, they're down on this child's level. Both of the first responders are. You have one first responder here, one first responder here, notice that they're both wearing gloves and they're down at the child's level with mom holding the child. All right, so pediatric anatomy and function. Children and adults have the same body systems that perform the same functions, but certain differences do exist. A child's airway is smaller in relation to the rest of the body compared to an adult's airway. It is more easily blocked by secretions or by swelling. A child's tongue is proportionally larger than the adult's. It can be more easily blocked uh, the airway if the child becomes unresponsive. So in this figure, we see the anatomy of a child airway differs from that of an adult. The tongue is proportionally larger and can easily block the airway. Also, the back of a child's head is larger, so head positioning is much more uh, you know, much more difficult. Uh, one of the things that we always recommend is if you can get a towel or a pillow and put up underneath the shoulders, it will help to keep the airway open. But as you can see here, here's the proportionally larger tongue than compared to the adult. It is much fatter. All right, so a child's upper airway is much more flexible than that of an adult, so avoid hyperextending the neck when attempting to open the airway. We are going to be practicing this in lab. Position the head in a neutral or slight sniffing position. For at least the first six months of their lives, infants can breathe only through their noses. So be sure to clear the nose of any mucus secretions. 
When the demands of a child's respiratory system change, the child is able to quickly compensate by increasing his or her breathing rate in their efforts. However, these compensatory mechanisms will function only for a short period of time. The child may show signs of severe respiratory distress and rapidly progress to respiratory failure. So, performing a thorough patient assessment and rechecking vital signs at least every five minutes is very important. All right, so infants and children have limited abilities to compensate for changes in temperature compared to adults. So children lose relatively more heat than adults do. So we need to keep our pediatric patients warm if they become chilled. So blankets, clothing, those kind of things. All right, so the examination. The examination of a child should consist of the same five steps used in the patient assessment sequence for the adults. Perform your scene size up to ensure that the scene is safe for you to uh, for you and the patient and for you to enter the scene itself. Complete your primary assessment and in that forming that general impression of the patient, determining the patient's level of responsiveness, assess, assess the status of the airway breathing and circulation. Then complete a secondary assessment, assessment by examining the child from head to toe, obtain the medical history, perform reassessments as needed. Okay, so the pediatric assessment triangle, the PAT was developed to help you quickly form a general impression of a child using only your senses, sight, and hearing. And what I mean by the general impression is when you first walk in, when you first see the child, and it's that first general impression that's formed within the first, you know, five to ten seconds of that, that first meeting. What this does is it provides you with an accurate initial picture of the functioning of the child's airway, breathing, circulation, and level of responsiveness. The PAT can be used to assess a child from a distance and to determine which next steps should be taken first. So in this figure, the three components of the PAT include appearance, work of breathing, and circulation to the skin. Very important stuff. And like I said, this is in that first, you know, five to 10 seconds when you walk in. It's that overview. And I always like to tell my students, especially my EMT students and my paramedic students, I remind them, just think sick or not sick. If you have a child that's sitting there not moving, not looking around, that's a sick child. But you have a child sitting there playing with a toy that seems to be happy. Okay, we can go a little bit slower approach versus a fast approach if they are sick. All right, so in the triangle, let's talk about appearance. The general appearance is an indicator of how well the heart and lungs are working. The appearance is also a good indication on how well the central nervous system is working. So how is all the touchy feely and the, you know, everything that has to do with automatic stuff like heartbeat, respirations, that kind of stuff, how is that stuff working? Okay. Um, the comparing the child's appearance and actions with what you would normally expect from a healthy child of the same age as what we're doing here. So we're assessing the child's eye contact, their muscle tone, their skin color. A child who is not crying may have a decreased level of consciousness, an upper airway affection, or swelling of the airway. A child who is unresponsive, is lackluster, and appears ill should be evaluated carefully. So reassessing the child's appearance regularly because it can change very quickly is a very important part of this component. So it isn't just the initial appearance, it's also a reassessment. This is something that we can automatically see. You know, we're seeing it with the eyes. We don't have to use a stethoscope, a blood pressure cuff, any of that stuff. This is just what we see. Very, very important stuff. All right, so characteristics of appearance. Uh, characteristic is on the, le on the left. What you should see in a healthy reaction is in the center and an unhealthy reaction to the right. All right, so work of breathing is what we're going to talk about next. Assessing the work of breathing is more accurate indicator of a child's condition than merely determining the rate of respirations. The work of breathing is determined by measuring the following four factors. Abnormal breath sounds, abnormal positioning, retractions of the neck or chest, 
flaring of the nostrils. So these are the things that we're going to be looking for, okay? And as you can see in table 17-2, it gives you those characteristics and what you should be looking for. Assessments can be made without touching the child and can be done from across the room. Okay, so that table there on 17-2 is in your book. You need to look that up and just be very familiar with that. All right, so circulation, circulation to the skin. There are three characteristics for determining circulation, paleness, mottling, and cyanosis. Paleness is a whiter pale skin indicates inadequate blood flow to the skin. Mottling is patchy skin discoloration that is caused by too much or too little circulation to the skin. And cyanosis is a bluish discoloration caused by low levels of oxygen in the blood. The PAT or the Pediatric Assessment Triangle should be used with other parts of the patient assessment sequence. Be sure you're familiar with this table 17-3 that's in your book. All right, so respirations. To calculate the respiratory rate of a child, you should count respirations for 30 seconds and then multiply that number by two. Look for signs of respiratory distress. Assess how much work the child is doing to breathe. Look for abnormal breath sounds, noisy breathing, snoring, crowing, grunting. All these things are stuff that we're looking for to include also wheezing. We also want to determine whether the child is holding himself or herself in a abnormal position. Are they tripoding? Are they sitting forward? Are they trying to keep their airway open? Check for also retractions of the neck and chest muscles and look for flaring of the nostrils. Pulse rate. All right, so the pulse rate. The normal pulse rate of a child is faster than an adult's normal rate. For a child younger than one year, palpate the brachial pulse. As you can see here, he is palpating the brachial pulse right here. This is called the brachius plexus. Okay, that is where the brachial pulse can be found. It doesn't cause any pain for the child. You're just looking for that pulse. Okay, simple to find. So the best practice or the best place to take that pulse is right there in that area. All right, so these are normal vital signs for children at rest. This is table 17-4 that's in your book. Make sure you're familiar with these rates. Just really notice that we start to average out with the same as adults when we get into the adolescent age, you know, 60 to 100, and then the breast per minute, 12 to 20. So this is just a good roundabout figure to know. All right, so high body temperature. High body temperatures in children offer accompanied by flushed red skin, sweatiness, and restlessness. To feel for a high temperature, touch the child's chest and head. The child's heart rate also increases with each degree of temperature rise. Respiratory care. It is very important to open and maintain a child's airway and to ventilate adequately any child with respiratory problems. Problems can lead to respiratory arrest, which will follow cardiac arrest. Causes of cardiopulmonary arrest in children include suffocation caused by aspiration of foreign body, infections of the airway such as croup and epiglottitis, SIDS, which is sudden infant death syndrome, accidental poisonings, and injuries around the head and neck. All right, so treating a respiratory emergency in an infant and a children. First thing is open the airway. As you can see here, he's got his fingers right up underneath her chin and a hand back behind the head. It is also, like I mentioned earlier, if you have a small towel roll, put it up underneath behind the shoulders and help to open the airway. The general techniques are the same for children and adults. The head tilt chin lift maneuver can be used for children who have not sustained injury to the neck or head. Do not hyperextend the child's neck when you tilt the head back. Use a neutral or slight sniffing position and place that folded towel underneath the child's shoulders to help maintain that position. This figure does show you the head tilt maneuver, head tilt chin lift maneuver. All right, so if possible, uh, if there's a possibility of an injury to the head or neck, it does exist, try the jaw thrust maneuver. Uh, in basic life support, you must use specific techniques when you perform cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR in children. 
CPR for children one years of age to the onset of puberty is different from adult CPR in three ways. First way, if you're alone and the EMS system has not been called, you should perform five cycles or two minutes of CPR before leaving to activate the EMS system. Also, using the heel of one hand or two hands to perform chest compressions depending on the size of the child. And finally, three, compressing the sternum at least one third the depth of the chest. In this figure, it shows you we've got one hand on the, on the uh, chest, in the middle of the chest, between the nipple lines of a child. All right, so CPR for infants younger than one year has five differences from adult CPR. Number one, it's checked for responsiveness by tapping on the infant's foot or gently shaking their shoulders. Check for a brachial pulse, and then use your middle and ring finger to compress the sternum just below the nipple line. Compress the sternum at least one third the depth of the chest and give rescue breaths using mouth to mouth or, or mouth to nose ventilations. Suctioning. All right, so when a patient's airway is blocked by secretion, vomitus, or blood, you should clear it initially by turning the patient on his or her side and use your glove finger to scoop out as much of the substance as possible. You can use suctioning to remove a foreign substance that cannot be removed with a glove finger. Suctioning can be a life-saving procedure. The procedure for suctioning uh, infants and children is generally the same as adults, except for with some exceptions. Number one, use a tonsil tip or rigid tip to suction the mouth. Do not insert the tip any farther than you can see. Use a flexible catheter to suction the nose of the child. Set up the suction on low or medium power. And then use a bulb syringe to suction the nose of an infant. Never suction for more than five seconds at any one time. Try to ventilate and reoxygenate the patient before repeating any suctioning. Airway adjuncts. Oral airways can maintain an open airway after you have opened the patient's airway with a manual means. Use the step in skill drill 17-1 to insert an oral airway into a child or an infant. We will practice this in lab. Emergency medical responders rarely use nasal airways for children. All right, so mid-partial airway obstruction, um, mild, mild partial airway obstruction. You can usually relieve mild airway obstructions by placing the child on his or her back, tilting the head and lifting the chin in the usual manner. An airway that is blocked with an aspirated foreign object is a common problem in young children. Remove the object if it's clearly visible in the mouth and can be removed easily. If not, do an attempt to remove the object as long as the child can still breathe air around the object. Try to remove an object that is partially blocking a child's airway can push the object down and result in severe airway blockage. Children should be transported to the emergency department. Talk to the child constantly about what you're doing to provide comfort uh, to reduce his or her own terror. Uh, of the airway blockage. Most of the time, parents are able to realize the seriousness of the situation, redirect their motions, and work with you to reassure and calm the child. Generally, in these partial airway obstructions, the child will cough it up themselves. If you just encourage them, continue to cough. Now, administering oxygen, if it's available and you're trained to use it, you can place the oxygen mask over the child's mouth and nose and do not try to get an airtight seal. Uh, you know, hold it from about one or two inches away from the child's face so at the least they'll be a little bit more comfortable. All right, severe or complete airway obstruction. So the airway is complete. There's no noise. You can't hear anything. There's no coughing. No sounds are being made. So a severe airway obstruction is a serious emergency. A severe airway obstruction exists when the child has poor air exchange, increased breathing difficulty, a silent cough, inability to speak, or no air movement at all. Use the Heimlich maneuver because it provides enough energy to expel most of the foreign objects that could be completely blocking the child's airway. So here you can see in this particular diagram how they're performing the Heimlich maneuver uh, on a child. She gets down to his level, wraps her arms around him, and does upward abdominal thrust 
over and over again until it comes out or until the child falls unconscious. All right, so the steps for relieving an airway obstruction in a conscious child are the same as an adult patient with a few slight adjustments. When opening the airway of a child or an infant, tilt the head back just past the neutral position. If you are by yourself and a child with an airway obstruction becomes unresponsive, perform CPR for five cycles, about two minutes, before activating the EMS system. All right, so complete or severe airway obstruction in infants. An infant younger than one years of age is very fragile. If you suspect an airway obstruction, first assess the infant to determine whether any air exchange is occurring. If the infant is crying, the airway is not completely obstructed. If no air is moving in or out of the infant's mouth and nose, suspect an obstructed airway. To relieve an airway obstruction in a conscious infant, use a combination of back slaps and chest thrust maneuvers. Assess the infant's airway and breathing status. Place the infant in a face down position over one of your arms and deliver five back slaps forcefully between the infant's shoulder blades and with the heel of one of your hands. In this figure, you can see that the child is being held very firmly, okay? and they're doing back slaps, okay? And then they're gonna turn the child over and do chest thrust maneuvers. We will practice this within our lab session. Now, one of the things that I notice is that you want to try to get the infant's head in a more down position so that the object will fall very easily out of the mouth. Let gravity go with the flow on that. And like I said, we'll practice this in lab so you'll be proficient at it. All right, so turn the infant face up, as you can see here, by sandwiching the infant between your hands and your arms and deliver five chest thrusts in the middle of the sternum with your two fingers. So again, five back slaps, five chest thrusts. And you're gonna repeat the series of back slaps and chest thrusts until the foreign object is expelled or until the infant becomes unresponsive. As you can see here, administering back slaps and chest thrusts in the infant uh, you're sandwiching them between your hands and turning the infant over and then giving the infant five chest thrusts using two fingers, just like you would do CPR, only this child is, is conscious and alert. This is in hopes of pushing enough on the chest that air comes out of the lungs, goes up through the trachea, and then expels the object. Uh, most of my experiences when this worked is when we have the head down and we're doing the back slaps and then it comes out. Just make sure to keep that head as, as pointed down as you can because that will allow for it to facilitate itself. The infant's not going to be happy about it, but that's okay. we got to get that thing out of there before they fall unconscious. All right, so complete or severe airway continuing. The infant becomes unresponsive we're gonna start following with our CPR steps. Ensure EMS has been activated and begin CPR. And continue CPR until personnel with more advanced EMS skills arrive. All right, so swallowed objects, sometimes children, as you know, we know they experience everything through their mouth, especially our toddlers. So if a small round object does uh, not become an airway obstruction, they usually pass unevently through the child and are eliminated in a bowel movement. Now, when we do concern ourselves when there's a sharp, sharp or a straight objects, uh, they are quite a bit of dangerous and they, we need to get them promptly transported to the emergency department. Either way, if they swallow an object, we need to make sure to take them to the hospital to be examined. That's why mom and dad call, because they don't know what to do. So the best thing to do is get them to a hospital and let the uh, physicians take a look at them. All right, so respiratory distress. Respiratory distress indicates a child has a serious problem that requires immediate medical attention. Sign of respiratory distress include a breathing rate of more than 60 per minute in an infant, a breathing rate more than 30 to 40 breaths per minute in a child, and also nasal flaring on each breath. Also retractions of the skin between the ribs and around the neck muscles and any strider or any noises that you may hear. And the patient looks like they're in trouble. They usually got big old eyes and they, you know, they may be turned a little bit blue. So they're in respiratory distress and you need to recognize that. 
All right, so looking at the child, you know, like I said, you might see the cyanosis. That's that bluish color. They also may have altered mental status. They may be combative or restless. So how do we treat this? Well, first off, we need to try to determine the cause. Then you need to support the respirations by placing the child in a comfortable position, usually in a sitting position, and start talking with mom and find out what's going on. All right, so keep the child as calm as possible by letting the parent hold the child if practical, and then prepare to administer oxygen if it's available and you're trained to do so. And then monitor the child's vital signs and arrange for a prompt transport to a hospital. All right, so respiratory failure and respiratory arrest. Respiratory failure often results in respiratory distress as it proceeds, okay? Uh, you know, signs of respiratory failure include a breathing rate of fewer than 20 breaths per minute in an infant and a breathing rate of less than 10 per minute in a child. Also, they may have uh, signs and symptoms of a limp muscle tone. That means they're just kind of flaccid. They're just laying there uh, without any ability to, to move or exchange air. Also, they could be unresponsive. They could have decrease or absent heart rate, weak or absent distal pulses. A child in respiratory failure is on the verge of experiencing respiratory and cardiac arrest. So we try to spot them right away and start doing something about it. So treatment, support respirations by performing mouth to mouth ventilations, administer oxygen if it's available, and begin chest uh, compressions if the heart rate is absent or less than 60 beats per minute, and then arrange for prompt transport. Call 911 right away. All right, so circulatory failure. The most common cause of circulatory failure in children is respiratory failure. So uncorrected circulatory failure can lead to cardiac arrest. An increased heart rate, pale or bluish skin, and changes in mental status indicate circulatory failure. If the heart rate is more than 60 per minute, complete the patient assessment sequence, support ventilations, administer oxygen, and observe for vital signs. If the heart rate is less than 60 per minute and there are signs of poor circulation, begin chest compressions and rescue breathing and be sure to call 911 as soon as possible. All right, so altered mental status. Not many illnesses occur suddenly in young children. It takes time. So it is important to recognize and treat the key pediatric illnesses. So altered mental status. Causes of altered mental status in children include low blood glucose levels, poisonings, post-seizure states, infections, head trauma, and decreased oxygen levels, or what we call hypoxia. Complete the patient assessment, paying particular attention to any clues at the scene. Pay particular attention to the patient's vital signs. Recheck vital signs regularly to monitor any changes. Calm the patient and the patient's family. Be prepared to support the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation if needed. And place an unconscious patient in the recovery position. Lay them on their side as you were trained in the BLS section. All right, so respiratory illnesses. A respiratory problem can range from a minor cold to a complete blockage of the airway. Because infants breathe primarily through their noses, and even, even a minor cold can cause difficulties in breathing. EMRs or first responders should be able to recognize the uh, three serious conditions, such as asthma, croup, and epiglottitis. Now, asthma, a child who has asthma is usually already being treated for the condition by a physician and is taking a prescribed medication. Asthma is caused by a spasm or constriction and inflammation of the smaller airways in the lungs and usually produces a characteristic wheezing sound. A child who's experiencing an asthma attack is obviously in respiratory distress. The primary treatment consists of calming and reassuring both the parents and the child. You also can place the child in a sitting position to make breathing more comfortable. Pursed lip breathing relieves some of the internal lung pressures that can cause an asthma attack. 
If a child has an asthma medication but it has not been administered, help the parent administer the medication. If the child's physician is not available, arrange for prompt transport. This picture over here is a good representation of purse breathing. That's what we mean. We purse the lips like you're going to kiss somebody. Okay. This allows to the alveoli to remain expanded. It helps to prevent them from collapsing because it allows that a certain amount of pressure stays in the lungs. So it keeps the alveoli inflated. All right, so croup. Croup is an infection of the upper airway that occurs mainly in children that are between the ages of six months and six years of age, the six and six rule. The lower throat swells and compresses the airway, resulting in a hoarse whooping noise during inhalation and a seal-like barking cough. It sounds like a seal making those noises. Or, or, or. Croup occurs often in colder climates and is frequently accompanied by a cold. So if you have a six to six month old that has, you know, is in a colder or during the winter time and also had a cold that was related to it, they very well may have the croup. So a lack of fright and willingness to lie down are important signs that this, uh, uh, important signs that distinguish croup from epiglottitis, okay? If the EMS unit is delayed, ask the parents to turn on the hot water in a shower and close the bathroom door. If you get them into the, the, the bathroom, not in the actual shower itself, just turn the hot water on, that steam helps to open up the airway. That moist air, uh, moist warm air relaxes the vocal cords and lessens the croupy noise and can actually reduce the fright in the child as well. All right, so epiglottitis, much different. Remember the epiglottitis kid, you can't lay down, okay? They're drowning basically. Epiglottitis is a severe inflammation of the epiglottis, which is the small flap that covers the trachea during swallowing. The flap itself becomes inflamed and swollen so that air movement into the trachea is completely blocked. Signs and symptoms of epiglottitis is usually um, these ch children are sitting bolt upright. They cannot swallow. The child is not coughing. Uh, the child is drooling. The child is anxious and frightened and the child's chin is in a thrusted forward type of position. All right, so treatment, make the child comfortable, you know, as much as possible with very little handling as, you know, from you. Let mom and dad uh, calm them and keep everybody calm. Administer oxygen if you have it, and let's get them to the hospital right away because this is a serious emergency by which the airway could actually close if it, if it gets worse. All right, so drowning. Drowning is caused by submersion in water that initially causes respiratory arrest. It is the second most common cause of accidental death among children five years of age or younger in the United States. Ordinary water sources around the home increases the risk of drowning for young children. If you respond to a drowning situation, do not put yourself in danger as you uh, would attempt a rescue. So if you can't get something out to the individual, don't put yourself in danger. You know, only if you are trained on how to recover somebody that's drowning should you go after them. Otherwise, you should throw or you should reach one or the other. All right, so signs and symptoms of drowning include a lack of breathing and no pulse. The treatment is to assess the airway, breathing, and circulation. Turn the child onto one side and allow the water to drain out of the child's mouth. Use suction if it's available and start rescue breathing if necessary. Administer supplemental oxygen if it's available and you're trained to use it. If no pulse is present, start chest compressions. Because there is a chance that the patient has a cervical spine injury, you should always stabilize the neck. To reduce the risk of hypothermia, you also need to dry the child with towels and cover the child with dry blankets or jackets. And then, of course, arrange for prompt transport. All right, so heat-related illnesses. Heat-related illnesses may range from relatively minor muscle cramps and vomiting to heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Heat stroke is a serious and potentially fatal condition that requires rapid treatment. Remove the child's clothing, sponge water over the child, and fan him or her very briskly. 
You may also wrap the child in wet sheets to speed up the evaporation and cooling process, but do not let the child become too chilled and arrange for rapid transport. High fevers. Fevers are common in children and can be caused by so many different types of infections, especially ear and gastrointestinal infections. Because the temperature regulating mechanisms in young children are not fully developed, a very high temperature can occur very quickly. Most children can tolerate temperatures as high as 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius. So treatment, uncover the child so that the body heat can escape. Don't cover them up. Attempt to reduce the high temperature by undressing the child. Fan the child to cool him or her down and then protect the child during any seizures and make sure that normal breathing resume, resumes after each seizure. And when I'm talking about protect them, roll them on their side so their airway can be opened, ride the seizure out with them and make sure that they don't bang into any objects. Clear the area that's around them. Try to keep them as safe as possible. Seizures. Speaking of, seizures can result from high fever or from disorders such as epilepsy. Seizures can vary in intensity from simple momentary steering spells to generalized seizures that involve full body tremors. Seizures are not usually dangerous. During the seizure, the child loses consciousness, the eyes roll back, and the teeth become clenched, and then the body shakes with severe jerking movements. The child's skin becomes pale or turns blue. Sometimes the child loses bladder and bowel control. The treatment for this is place the patient on the floor or a bed to prevent injury. Maintain the adequate airway until after the seizure is over with. Good thing to do is roll them up on their side and do the best you can to ride it out with them. Provide supplemental oxygen if you have it and you're trained to use it, and then arrive, uh, arrange for prompt transport. Monitor the patient's vital signs and support their ABCs, and after the seizure is over, cool the patient if he or she has a high fever. Vomiting and diarrhea. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, buddy. Sometimes it comes out both ends. Vomiting and diarrhea are usually the cause by some kind of gastrointestinal infection. Prolonged vomiting and diarrhea may produce severe dehydration. The dehydrated child is lethargic and usually has very dry skin. Hospitalization may be required to replace fluids through the veins, such as with an IV. If you suspect that a child may be dehydrated, arrange for prompt, prompt transport right away. Okay, so children do have abdominal pains. Abdominal pains is one of the most serious causes, or one of the most serious causes of abdominal pain in children is appendicitis. Appendicitis is often seen in people who are between the ages of 10 and 25 years of age. A cramp and pain in the belly button area moves to the right lower quadrant of the abdomen, becoming, becoming more steady as a pain and more severe in nature. Usually the child is nauseated, has no appetite, and occasionally will vomit. Treat every child with a sore or tender abdomen as an emergency and arrange for prompt transport. All right, so poisoning. Young children are curious and often like to sample the contents of brightly colored bottles or cans. The two most common types of poisoning in children are those caused by ingestion and absorption. With ingested, an ingested poison is taken by mouth. A child who has ingested a poison may have the following signs and symptoms. Chemical burns, odors, or stains around the mouth, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and even possible diarrhea. Later symptoms may include also the following, abnormal or decreased respirations, unconsciousness, seizures. If you believe the child has ingested poisonous substances, take the following steps. Try to identify the poisoning and send the bottle or container along with the child to the emergency department. Gather any spilled tablets and replace uh, them in the bottle so that they can be counted properly. Contact the local poison control center if transportation is delayed. You may need to give the child large amounts of water or administer activated charcoal. Monitor the child's breathing and pulse closely, and then arrange for prompt transport. Absorption. This is poisoning by absorption. It occurs when the poisonous substance enters the body through the skin. 
A child who has absorbed a poison may have localized symptoms such as skin irritation or burning or systemic signs of, and symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, dizziness, and also shock. If you believe a child has an absorbed poison substance, you should do the following. Ensure the child has no longer in contact with the poison and substance. And then protect yourself from exposure and call for specifically trained personnel if indicated. Remove the child's clothing if you think that it's contaminated. Always remember to brush off any dry chemicals and then wash the child with water for at least 20 minutes. Wash off any liquid poisoning by flushing with water for at least 20 minutes and try to identify the poison. Also monitor the child for any changes in respirations and pulse. If also, if the child is vomited, try to save a sample of it so you can send it to the patient, uh, send it with the patient to the hospital. And always do remember arranging for, you know, prompt transport early is, is the best key. All right, sudden infant death syndrome. This is a condition that frequently is mistaken for a child abuse is, is SIDS. Uh, it's also called crib death as well. SIDS is, uh, is the sudden and unexpected death of an apparently healthy infant. SIDS usually occurs in infants between the ages of about three weeks and seven months old. There's really no adequate scientific explanation for SIDS. It's been one of these mysteries for many, many years. Uh, it has so many different related causes that no one has truly been able to put their finger on it. If the infant is still warm, begin CPR and continue until help arrives. In many cases, the infant has been dead for several hours and the body is cold and lifeless. Um, do not mistake the large bruise-like blotches on the infant's body for child abuse. The blotches are caused by the pooling of the infant's blood after death. Follow the protocol in your community for the management of deceased patients and be sure you're prepared to provide supportive and compassionate type of support uh, to the parents because they're going to need it the most. Pediatric trauma. Trauma is the number one killer of children. Treat an injured child as you would treat an injured adult, but remember the following differences. A child cannot communicate symptoms as well as an adult can. Also, a child may be shy and overwhelmed by adult rescuers, so it is important to develop a good relationship quickly to reduce the child's fear and anxiety. You may need to adapt materials and equipment to the child's size. A child does not show signs of shock as an early as an adult, but can progress into severe shock very, very quickly. Some of the patterns of injury, the pattern, patterns of injury sustained by children will reflect three different, will reflect based on three different factors. The type of trauma they experience is the first one. The type of activity causing the injury is the second. And then finally, the child's anatomy. In motor vehicle crashes, the unrestrained patients tend to have more head and neck injuries. Restrained patients offer suffer head, spinal, and abdominal injuries. And in bicycle accidents, children offer suffer head, spinal, abdominal, and extremity injuries, especially in those bicycle accidents. The use of bicycle helmets can greatly reduce the number of, of severity of the head injuries. So good training. Make sure that you, know, you get involved with community type of training of uh, bicycle safety. That's always a good plan. Uh, many fire departments and EMS agencies do that throughout their community. They actually provide elbow pads, knee pads, and helmets. And so it's a good program. All right, so children hit by cars, very, very unfortunate. Usually this type of blunt trauma causes a lot of injuries. Uh, pedestrians often sustain chest, abdomen, thigh, and head injuries. Falls from a height uh, or diving accidents tend to also cause head and spinal injuries and extreme injuries. And then finally, burns uh, are a major cause of injuries to children. In this figure, notice that with the you know auto versus child, the bumper in this area right here strikes the chest and the abdomen and the pelvis. So, and then the head strikes the car itself. So they end up having very, very severe injuries. And then of course, when they're knocked away from the car, their head usually hits the ground. So they, this is a very serious type of trauma that uh, children can, 
can uh, develop. And then we're looking for those patterns of injury uh, to determine how severe it is for the child. All right, so sports activities cause a wide variety of injuries depending on the type of sports activity. Treatment, regardless of the cause of injury, always includes check the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation, stop any severe bleeding, treat the patient for shock, and conduct a full body assessment. Stabilize all injuries as much as possible that you find, and if the patient has head lacerations, treat the wounds with direct pressure and appropriate bandaging techniques. All right, so traumatic shock in children. Now, children show shock symptoms much more slowly than adults do, but when they progress, when they, they compensate for only so long, when they get to the end of that compensation, uh, they fall into decompensation very, very quickly. If signs of shock are present, the child's already in severe shock, so they're already there. Signs of shock include cool, clammy skin, rapid weak pulses, rapid or shallow respiration. So if they've got any of these type of signs, okay, sign symptoms, uh, we need to associate those with severe shock. So seizures, seizures are relatively common in children who have sustained a severe or a serious head injury. The greatest dangers to any patient who has sustained uh, trauma are airway obstruction and hemorrhage. So when caring for an injured child, make sure that we open and maintain a good airway, control the bleeding, and arrange for prompt transport. Car seats, good stuff. Now, if you find a child properly restrained in a car seat, after a motor vehicle crash, leave them in the car seat until the ambulance arrives. Do the best you can to keep them calm, keep them still. So in many cases, the child will be transported within the same seat. So they know it, they're familiar with it. This is what keeps them a little bit more comfortable. This child doesn't look very happy, does she? <laughs> so <laughs> you can't, can't win them all, I guess, huh? Child abuse, uh, big stuff. Uh, child abuse is not limited to any ethnic, social, or economic group <clears throat> or to families with any particular level of education. It happens. Suspect abuse if the child's injuries don't match the story you're told about how the injury occurs. Don't be judgmental, though. Make sure you're just gathering information. The abused child may have uh, many visible injuries at different stages of healing. So be concerned also if the child is withdrawn, fearful, or hostile and is unwilling to discuss how the injuries occurred. Treat the child's injuries, and if you are suspicious that the incident may involve child abuse, ensure that the, the child is safe. That's the number one key. Signs and symptoms, any of this, multiple fractures, bruises at various stages of healing, human bites, yes, you can find human bites, burns, especially particularly like cigarette burns, cigar burns, you know, these odd looking round burns. And then reports from the caregivers of bizarre accidents and just fabricated stories that don't make a whole lot of sense. All right, so here's some, uh, some different signs of child abuse, as you can see. Uh, picture from the left to right. Uh, left is obvious bruising, that's pretty extreme. The, the center is a bite, and you can see the swelling uh, on that human bite. And then also, there's no reason for a child to have you know, these kind of burns on their feet. Uh, this child was dipped into boiling water or boiling grease, something along those lines. So not a good thing. Transportation of the child, if the parents object to having the child examined by a physician, summon law enforcement, get them involved. Uh, you should have law enforcement involved in this and explain your concerns to them and then just kind of go from there. Neglect is another form of child abuse. Uh, children who are neglected are often dirty or too thin or appear developmentally delayed because of the lack of stimulation, also the lack of nourishment as well. Uh, signs and symptoms, uh, lack of adult supervision, malnourished appearing children, uh, unsafe living environments, and then untreated chronic illnesses such as asthma. Handle each situation in a non-judgmental manner, like I mentioned earlier, and know whom you need to contact to report uh, suspected cases. A um, good international uh, telephone number, write this down, 1-800-96-ABUSE. That was a, a abuse hotline for elderly children, teenagers, it doesn't matter. 
you can report it to to that particular that is a a uh, nationally uh, known telephone number for abuse hotline that's 1-800-96-ABUSE that's where the 96 came from it started in 1996 all right sexual assault to children yep in addition to experiencing sexual assault the child may have been beaten and may have other serious injuries if you suspect sexual assault has occurred obtain as much information as possible from the child and any witnesses um, providing a caring approach is most important and it's it's extremely important and you should take appropriate action to shield the child from uh, any onlookers all victims of sexual assault should receive transport in a, to an appropriate facility all right, so emergency medical responder debriefing. You're gonna be respond to many calls that involve children and it's tough. These particular calls tend to produce strong emotional type of reactions. You may feel especially angry or helpless when you suspect the neglect or abuse of a child. So you may need to talk about your frustrations with a counselor or with another member of your department following serious pediatric calls. It may be helpful to set up a critical incident stress debriefing session. By attending a debriefing session, you can express your feelings, you know, learn some coping strategies, and maintain a, a more healthy approach to future calls. A child's airway is smaller in relation to the rest of the body compared to an adult airway, so secretion swelling from illness or trauma can more easily block the child's airway. Because the tongue is relatively larger, then the tongue of an adult, a child's tongue can more easily block the airway. So hyperextension of the neck uh, can occlude the airway. So you got to be careful with all that. <clears throat> and remembering this kind of goes along with the fact that with your need for debriefing, you know, you'll remember these things. You'll remember, you know, about not hyperextending the child's airway uh, to occlude it, you know, and you'll be more comfortable with managing children. So. Do be thinking of that if you, you know, have an incident with a child and you're feeling bad about it. You need to talk to folks. That's what stress debriefing is all about. All right, in summary, we talked about the anatomy of children, how it differs from adults. We also talked about how both the child and parents may be frightened and anxious and you need to do anything that you need to do to make that more of a calm situation. All right, the child is unresponsive, his lackluster appears ill, should be evaluated carefully. Don't forget about the pediatric assessment triangle, uh, appearance, work of breathing, and circulation. It's important to open and maintain the airway, and young children often obstruct their airway with foreign objects, objects such as small toys or candies, buttons, coins, all kinds of stuff. Be prepared for that. It's also a complete or severe airway obstruction in a conscious child about doing, child about doing the Heimlich maneuver. And also knowing how to relieve an airway obstruction uses a combination of back slaps and chest thrust with the infant. We learned that. And don't, don't worry, we're going to practice all this in lab, so you're going to get all that, so no worries. Three serious respiratory problems in children. Remember these three, the big three, asthma, croup, and epiglottitis and uh, what you're supposed to do about them. So those are the big three that you need to know that are, that are scary respiratory problems that can be easily managed in some respects and arranging for prompt transport for these patients. Other pediatric medical emergencies such as drowning, heat-related illness, heat stroke, high fever, seizures, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain are all part of it and they're, they're usually fairly simple to manage. Two most common types of poisoning, ingestion and absorption. Ingestion is usually taken by mouth and absorption is entering through the skin. And also we talked about SIDS and what that means and uh, how this is a very sad time and that you, you know, many, many times that you can't do anything about this. You just have to manage your relationship and be compassionate with uh, the parents, you know, because they're going to become the patients. And finally, major trauma in children usually results in multiple system injuries. And if you suspect child abuse or sexual assault, you must transport the child to an appropriate facility and be sure that you get law enforcement involved. It's so much easier uh, with them being involved and then they can do the investigation and, and manage the scene itself. All right, you folks know what this means, assessment times, congratulations. Go back to your Navigate dashboard to go to your assessments block. 
open that chapter assessment and complete it. Uh, and again, you can take the assessment as many times as you like, and you got to get 70% or higher. Awesome. This is your brain on knowledge, right? Ooh, there it is, full of knowledge. Yay! It's a good, good thing to work your little hand out with. All right, well, you know what the deal is. You got any questions? Awesome. Thanks for your participation. You know how to get in touch with us. Student at emats.net. We'll get back with you as soon as possible. Okay, hope you enjoyed this pediatric lecture. We'll see you next time.